Hello, fellow Westorians. We sure do have a special episode today. Over an hour of conversation with the man himself in his own office, George R. R. Martin. We were a little nervous. Not of him, really. We've met him before, and he's a super, super nice guy. A real fan of fantasy, sci-fi games, miniatures, as you can see if you're watching the video version. He lives and breathes and writes this stuff. He's way more famous and successful than anyone we know, but he's still one of us when you get down to it. A lot of people ask us what George is like. And every time I say that he's very chill and very down to earth and friendly, and that remained true in this interview. Going into the interview, I wasn't worried about him being a bad interview subject. I was just worried something would go wrong, like a technical problem, that we'd lose the recording or something like that. That's always a fear when you're recording, but yeah. <laughs> it's always it peaks when <laughs> in moments like this. <laughs> George is no stranger to interviews, and we assume most of you out there have seen, heard, read all the above him interviewed before. So we wanted to try to do a few things differently, and we wanted to deliver on that expectation. We, we set ourselves a goal. We tried not to ask questions he's heard before. We asked a few more lore and world building questions. We, of course, didn't ask anything about Winds of Winter because that would have been a wasted time. And we didn't have a lot of time. He's never going to answer a question like that anyway. So mm. Mostly, we just listened. He does not need much to get going. He's obviously a natural at holding court and at storytelling. He gives lengthy answers to almost everything. That's great. That's what we wanted. The only downside is that we couldn't ask as many questions as we wanted. Uh, that included a lot of the great questions y'all sent us. We crowdsourced a lot of good ones, but most didn't get asked. We didn't even get to ask most of the ones we wanted to ask, but hey, no biggie. Yeah, this wasn't a short session at all, and I think we overall accomplished what we set out to do, which was record a conversation with George R.R. R. Martin that contained some new questions and that will be widely accessible afterwards. That's why it took a little bit longer to get out. Ashea here went through triple max effort to make the subtitles perfect, looking up the spelling of every person, place, or thing George named. So we highly recommend that you watch the video version because it uses multiple cameras in addition to the perfect subtitles and because you'll get to see George's cool stuff all over the room um, <laughs> that we recorded in. But of course, as always, the audio only version is perfectly solid as well. Yeah. What you're about to hear and see was recorded on Thursday, August 18th, a few hours before all of us, George included, saw House of the Dragon episode one at his John Cocteau Theater. Enjoy. If someone's watching or listening to this interview, they've probably read or listened to all of your interviews. So let's try to um, go on some untreaded on ground. Yeah, you're... There are probably most... hundreds of those interviews. Oh, there's a lot. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're out there. I mean... So many, yeah. It's um, a great, great reason. And our listeners are the types who are very experienced. They're not new. They haven't, they've read the series. Most people have read the series more than once. So they, they've heard interviews with you before. This is almost certainly... Right. Any listener to our show has probably heard an interview with before. So, like I said in advance, this will be edited. So, if, if at any ask point, me who's my favorite character? We won't ask you that. <laughs> uh, we know it's Victorian. You've said it many times. <laughs> but no, we, we, it will be edited. So, feel free if you're like, put that off the record or edit, say, just Bye. don't worry about saying that. Um, so, we wanted to bring up, we wanted to talk about topics like House of the Dragon, writing an adaptation, fandom itself, and conventions. And some listener submitted questions as well, just to let you know what we're going to talk about today. Okay. Yeah. Um, one thing that we thought was really interesting when we wrote a little bit of a chapter about your works called The Game of Thrones Effect, and there is a lot of references to A Song of Ice and Fire in things like scientific taxonomy. Like, there's a lot of species named <laughs> after you. Are you aware of all of them? Do they let you know about every one of these? Not every one. No. I, I have heard about a, a few over the years uh, where someone has said some new kind of cricket or uh -huh. sea worm or something like that has been named either after mostly after my characters not after me myself. yeah most yeah yeah there's a uh, maraxes gigas like was a right. new one it's yeah, a new it's dinosaur a dinosaur and there's i don't know how to say this but it's oxyrosera varus it's a spirit okay a spider of course yeah <laughs> and there's um there's a really funny one speaking of the deep sea worms that you there's a hodor anduril 
Uh, they, they combined Lord of the Rings with Hoda. A very weird decision by those scientists, but good on them. Oh, very cool. Yeah, you should send me a list of all of these. We, yeah, we yeah, should. Yeah, yeah that's a lot. We, should, uh, yeah. we will say I'm Tolkien not has a beat. Where I would blog about yeah. that. that would be yeah, cool. there's probably like 20 or something named after your characters, and Tolkien's got like 100 plus. So you got a while to go. Um, as far as I know, though, however, um, I, no one has yet named a star or a planet or any uh, no. extraterrestrial kind of thing after me or a crater on Pluto. Ooh. I mean, there are other uh, <laughs> science fiction fantasy writers who, who have been things like that mm. named after them. I was well, a science fiction writer yeah, need, mostly when I began, as you probably probably know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, no, I always wrote fantasy, too, but... Um, um, when I started in the in the seventies, when I first started publishing professionally, fantasy, yeah, Tolkien had been big, but he was considered um, a, a freakish, one of a kind thing. Mm. Oh, um, th this is not a genre. This is uh, you know a, a best selling book that was mm. very big, but no one will ever duplicate it. So fantasy was sort of uh, minor compared to uh, the markets for science fiction, and and uh, I wrote a lot of science fiction in those days. That's interesting. Yeah, I've, we've read um, your Thousand Worlds stuff. I've read all of it, and it's it's amazing. Is there any is there any uh, thought to? I know that Night Flyers was a thing. Is there any thought of any of the other ones getting adapted? Or yeah, we, I mean, we we occasionally talk about uh, things like that. Night Flyers was adapted twice. Once as a movie in nineteen eighty seven, and then as uh, the TV show that came on uh, on the Sci Fi Channel just uh, year before mm -hmm. last, I think it was uh, Sand Kings. Mm -hmm. was also adapted as a two-hour premiere of the Revive Outer Limits. Mm. Um, and uh, oh, there <laughs> various people have tried to make a, a Sand Kings movie mm. um, over the years. There have been a number of screenplays written, and uh, um, some better than others. Uh, but um, so far, we we haven't actually got a green light on that. Mm. Okay. As a, as that, a is, that is something that I, that I wish... Uh, more to fans understood uh, where I, I really sometimes I wonder um, from the comments I get whether whether uh, all of the, the fans or readers out there understood how, how Hollywood works and all that you know I, I have a large um, backlist of stories and books that I wrote I wrote like 70 or 80 short stories many of them uh, mm -hmm. The Thousand World stories you're referring mm -hmm. to, but also mm -hmm. a few fantasies, a few science fiction stories that took place in other universes, mm -hmm. a number of contemporary horror stories or historical horror stories. I wrote a number of novels before. And I had 20 years from 1971 when I wrote my first story to 1991, which is when I began Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. And all those stories are out there, and I have agents and managers who are, you know, eagerly trying to uh, sell the rights to them. And every time one of them sells and we make an announcement, I get this wave of people angry. Oh, he's not working on Winds of Winter. He's <laughs> he's now working on saying, I'm not working on it. Don't you understand? It's like, <laughs> I wrote that 20 years I ago. I wrote this story in 1979. <laughs> Someone bought it. They gave me a big pot of money and uh, good luck to them. Uh, <laughs> and maybe I have a meeting with them or a lunch. Maybe they ask me my opinion. Maybe they don't ask me my opinion. <laughs> and they just do it anyway. But uh, thanks to my agents, I get a nice credit on it in the front. That doesn't mean I've put aside Winds of Winter to work on this project, I, my work on that project was largely done in 1979 <laughs> or 1984 or whatever. Yes. Uh, so uh, that drives me a little crazy. I, I don't know if people really don't understand the way pro Hollywood works or, or they don't understand. Not, but, they don't. Yeah. They don't understand. We actually had planned to, to ask some questions that clarify some of that. Maybe okay. um, in, in line with that. So that's great. For example, I think that. There's an, uh, if we're talking about the current TV show and the past TV show, there was an understanding that you were more of a, on a consultant level for the first TV show. If maybe that's not the right term or a co-producer. I don't know the exact terms, but your involvement with House of Dragons, obviously. Well, my, much my title greater. on Game of Thrones was co-executive. Co-executive producer. Okay. And now, but now you're and now involved it's involved uh, executive producer on this one. Mm. I, I lost a co. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, that's another thing that, that I think the fans don't understand, and, and uh, sometimes people in Hollywood don't understand them either. Yeah. Uh, like uh, which is, uh, you know, particularly the, the uh, producer title. Um, 
I remember during my first go round in, in television back in the uh, 80s and 90s, I, I was uh, uh, hired on Twilight Zone. It was mm-hmm. the first show I worked on. Not the original one with Rod Serling. I'm, old, but I'm not that old. <laughs> I was in grade school when Rod Serling's show was on. <laughs> but uh, Twilight Zone was revived by Phil DeGare in, uh, in the mid-80s, 85, 85, 86. Um, and uh, I was wrote five scripts for that show, and I was brought on. And I was brought on as a staff writer. Uh, that is that is probably the lowest title that you can mm-hmm. get on a, on a television show. And you can tell it's the lowest title because it's the only one that actually has the word writer. In it. <laughs> <laughs> I like to hide that. But um, mm-hmm. and, uh, after that, I was promoted to story editor. And uh, then when I went to uh, Twilight Zone End and I went to Beauty and the Beast, I was hired as executive story editor. Mm-hmm. Now, executive story editor is is better than story mm-hmm. editor. It's executive. It's like it's a, a plus sign. You know? <laughs> so you went uh, and and then from executive story editor, uh, I got the title on Beauty and the Beast co producer, mm. and that was a promotion and there was more money and it's a mm-hmm. better title. It has the p word in it. <laughs> you know, the p word is very uh, uh, very important. Um, but I looked around and I said. There are no other co-producers. How can I be co-producer? Doesn't co-producer imply that there would be like another co-producer? <laughs> no, co-producer is just like yeah. a minus. Oh. Executive is a plus. Co-producer is a minus. I'm not quite as high up the ladder as a producer. But I'm only a co-producer. So, uh, so you you go up the ladder. Eventually, of course, I did get pr- promoted to uh, producer. And then later I got to be co-supervising producer and then <laughs> supervising producer without the co. So, uh, you know, you, you yeah. climb these things. It's way so, more ranks yeah. than I thought. Could, could you elaborate? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's complicated. And it, it, they change it all the time mm. um, because um, an executive producer is, you know, back in the 80s and 90s uh, when I was active, there was most shows had only one executive producer, and that was the showrunner. Showrunner was a term that the public never heard. You know, Very you, you never now. see a screen title yeah. showrunner, mm. Bill Smith, right? Mm-hmm. You never see that title. And the public didn't know anything about that. But the showrunner was the executive producer. He was the boss. Mm. And if you watch a show like uh, that was on in those days, like Dallas or something like that, usually that credit was the last credit at the end of the episode. So, mm. you know, you would see on Dallas, JR's face, yeah. he would be shocked if something had <laughs> happened and it would be... Executive producer, uh, Philip Capice, I still remember. I never met the man, but <laughs> there was his title over JR's face week after week. Um, and there was only one executive producer on Twilight mm. Zone. Our executive producer was uh, Phil DeGuerre. Mm. And on, on uh, Beauty and the Beast, it was Ron Coslow. Mm. Uh, they were the creators. They were executive producers. They were the showrunners. But over the years, um, I guess people have been, I, I don't know quite how it happened. So I'm speaking entirely from ignorance. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess people had been an executive producer on a show and that show had been canceled. And now they were hiring on to another show, but they didn't want to take a lower title, even mm-hmm. though they weren't the showrunner on the later show. They said, well, I have to keep my title. So suddenly shows started having two or three or four <laughs> executive producers. And now we have a lot of executive yeah. producers on a lot of shows. And but only one of them, or sometimes two of them, is the showrunner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sometimes um, two. So it it is it has gotten very complicated. Yeah, so showrunner is kind of a new. Yeah. It was it's not a new term, but it's a new yeah. title ish uh, thing. And so yeah, it's, and- it's not an official title, but okay. it is. Everybody well, knows who showrunner is. He's okay, yeah. the boss. Um, you know, I mean, ultimately, a network or a studio is the mm-hmm. boss. But of the people actually working on the show, the showrunner is the highest one, mm-hmm. and. You know, obviously on, on Game of Thrones, it was David Benioff and, and D.B. Weiss. Yeah. And uh, they were the showrunners. Uh, there were other executive producers by the end. And then there were several of us co-executive producers. But they were the they were the showrunners, mm-hmm. clearly. Mm-hmm. And on this new show, it's Miguel Sapochnik and right. Ryan Condal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, I have the same title as them, but I'm not the, <laughs> I'm not the showrunner. And there are a number of other mm-hmm. people who are also executive producers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you do this... If you move forward with the John Snow show, they'll need a snow runner for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so could you elaborate a little bit on how much creative control you feel like you have on these new endeavors, these new projects like House of the Dragon versus before? How, do you feel like your role has changed at all? Yeah, um, I don't have any creative 
control, as, mm-hmm. as you say. Yeah. Um, that is the hardest thing to get in Hollywood. Um, <laughs> yeah. No matter what the project is, whether it's a feature or a film, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. you it's given out very, very infrequently. I mean, you can, like, J.K. Rowling had a certain amount of creative control on Harry Potter because every studio in Hollywood wanted Harry Potter, and they were all uh, queuing mm. up, and she demanded, uh, you know, script approval and other mm-hmm. things. Makes sense. You know, um, but I don't but know you don't demand script people approval. have that. Um, I, I mean... <laughs> Hollywood will give you money a lot easier than it'll give you creative control. <laughs> you can go to negotiations and say, well, yes, I have, well, thank you for, you know, paying me $8 million, but I would like uh, creative control as well. And and they will say, how about $10 million? <laughs> <laughs> they would rather give millions of dollars than any creative control. At a certain and, point, I feel like you, you've got a lot of money. You have to be able to decide, eh, I don't want the money. Give me the control. Whether which was obviously J.K. Rowling's attitude. I mean, yeah. I, I don't really know privately what was yeah. her negotiations, but she had a number of suitors. Mm. Um, what I do have is influence. I mm. have a mm. creative uh, influence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that depends largely on the relationship between myself and the showrunners, mm-hmm. and um, so forth. I mean, I can, I can make points. I can argue, and and they can listen. But if 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 they decide not to listen, um, uh, then you know I can I can try to persuade them. <laughs> yeah. I can't. I mean, I don't have the power to uh, hire or to fire. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't have the power to uh, dictate things. Uh, but I have, if they listen to me, and I, mm-hmm. I can be fairly persuasive, uh, <laughs> and I know this material pretty well. So, um, so does that something? And it's mm-hmm. it's always changing. I mean, it's. Mm-hmm. You know, I had a lot of input in the beginning of Game of Thrones, partly because I had these books out there. Um, but at a certain part, as the show went on, I, I found I had less and less influence. Mm-hmm. Uh, until by the yeah. end, I really didn't even know what, what was going on. I, I Some of these things I watched like everybody else. And, oh, okay. <laughs> no, okay. I know. Uh, I mean, I, you could have given me a call and let me know. <laughs> <laughs> now, but, at the know. moment, uh, you know, I have a, a, I'm very happy with... Uh, House of the Dragon, it's a very faithful adaptation. Yeah, there's some changes. Yeah. But, um, but I have a great relationship with uh, Ryan Condal and Miguel Sapochnik. Uh, We've got a good feeling about him. We've really liked all the interviews he's done. He said yeah. all the right things so far. Yeah, we're interviewing Ryan in, in a little while, too. Yeah, later this month. So. But there are, as you say, a number of other shows in development. And everyone yeah. has a different showrunner and, yeah. and writer. And every relationship there is is different. Mm. So we shall see how all of those yeah. evolve. Yeah. So um, for House of the Dragon specifically, I've got a listener submit a question for you that I think all of us care a lot about. So I'm just going to read it because I think they framed it in a really good way. From Curtis W. Franks, he asked, how should we treat House of the Dragon in terms of canon? I would be treating it as yet another narrative, competing with Mushroom and other sources. It is one possible explanation and take on the sequence of events, but not necessarily more correct than any of the others when they are in conflict. It would add yet more uh, historiographic complexity to the story. How do you feel about that interpretation? Should we prioritize these interpretations over others when there is an outright conflict between them? So speak to canon. Okay, well, that's a very eloquently put question. Yes, I think he did a good job with that. Yes, Thanks, Curtis. Job, Curtis. <laughs> but it, it, it opens, uh, um, you know, a very large area for discussion. Mm-hmm. And um, I've been asked about this um, by various other interviewers in various forms in interviews past. And I often respond with uh, the question for the questioner, uh, how many children did Scarlett yeah. O'Hara have? <laughs> Yep. I mean, in Margaret Mitchell's novel, she has three. <laughs> in the classic MGM movie from uh, 1939 or so, she has one. Mm. <laughs> Which is real? How many children mm. should you have? Which should you believe? Depends believe on what canon we're the talking movie about. Or the book. Yeah. And of course, it's a trick question because <laughs> the. Uh, the real answer is she had none because she never existed. <laughs> <laughs> She's a fictional character <laughs> that uh, was no. made up. Come on uh, now. No, no. So uh, <laughs> she had she had no children. Um, 
it's a story. And there were two different ways that they chose to, to tell the story. The, the filmmakers simplified it. They didn't want to deal with the children of her first two husbands. Um, and they took them out. And as far as I can tell, very few people have missed them. Although <laughs> I'm not a big part of the Gone with the Wind fandom. Who knows? <laughs> they may be debating it over over there. Even They even, probably are. <laughs> if there is a Gone with the Wind fandom, there probably has to be. It's still a very popular yeah. book. And belief. Um, so This is this is somewhat the same question that uh, you know that I deal with. I mean, I, I yeah. wrote the books, um, I, I presented the story, at least for the first five books, and um, as as we got into it, um, Dave and Dan uh, did an amazing faithful adaptation in many ways, but not a hundred percent faithful adaptation. Yeah. They they um, started making changes even as early as as uh, season one. Mm-hmm. And I remember I had discussions with them back in season one um, when I was more involved in the process when, when we would discuss things. And, and like uh, the fact that they uh, removed uh, Jane Poole was oh, a yeah. very early thing. And yeah. They actually said, oh, no, Jane Poole is in it. You see the girl that's sitting <laughs> next to Sansa in the one scene in, in uh, the Feast of Winterfell. And, and yes, that, so that's Jane Poole. But yeah. you never hear her name and she's not in it. But I did tell them. Yes, but there's the butterfly effect, as mm-hmm. I called it, going deriving from the famous Red Ray Bradbury story of Sound mm-hmm. of Thunder. You know, you, you crush a butterfly in the Jurassic and suddenly you've changed the whole of human history from that point forward yes. unintentionally. A little change in a long narrative can have big changes further mm-hmm. on. Yeah. And Gone with the Wind didn't have to worry about mm-hmm. that because uh, those two children that they removed never had any impact on the story. Mm -hmm. And Margaret Mitchell didn't go on to write six more novels in which the children grew up and became the leader of the Ku Klux Klan. (laughs) Whatever the hell uh, she might have done with those two two boys. And I think they were both boys, the older children. (laughs) And uh, and, uh, Rhett's daughter was Mm -hmm. a girl. Um, So she didn't, didn't have to deal with the butterfly effect there. But, you know, when we removed Jane Poole from season one, then you don't have Jane Poole available for mm-hmm. to be the fake Arya, as Absolutely. happens in the book. So what do you do then? I mean, the butterfly effect has has done that. Yeah, yeah. I think um, um, you're familiar with The Expanse. I think one of the best adaptations would be, an, an example would be The Expanse TV show, where they had the writers in the writer's room. And I remember I was reading the books as the show aired, and there were some things that happened in season one, where I was like, that's not in the books. And then I got to book five, and right. they they were there adapting things in, in <laughs> all the way there, and I think they really it really showed how much having the author there to be like actually this is going to be important in a book I haven't even published yet, so like maybe keep that in can be really important. Yeah, and Ty and Daniel, well, you know, Ty was my assistant for years, and and uh, you know was part of uh, you know so many premieres and events yeah. and things like I went to, and he even went to Morocco with me oh, um, to, oh, fun. to watch them uh, shoot. Uh, uh, Danny's wedding and uh, various yeah. other things. So he he kind of knew the process from the inside. Um, and Daniel uh, lives here in New Mexico, mm-hmm. and I, I was his teacher at a session of Clarion West, and was in a mm-hmm. writers group with him, and all of that. So I I knew them pretty well, and and um, I, I think they were very wise to to go into the writers' room mm-hmm. and to do that because I know from. The stories they've told me that they encountered the the butterfly effect too. Mm-hmm. They would be in the writers' room, and the, and the showrunners, who was not them initially, would say, "Oh, we're going to remove this uh, person," and and you know, Ty or Daniel would say, "Well, well we could do that," but mm-hmm. then when you <laughs> get to season four, there's going to be a problem because you <laughs> took that other other thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the butterfly effect can have that. But, but getting back to the whole issue of canon, mm-hmm. um. The butterfly effect affects the canon, uh, but there's also sometimes deliberate changes in in a show where the um, the showrunners or the writers or the studio or the network or wherever it comes from, it, it goes in a different direction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what we're doing at this point in, in the history of A Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones, Westeros, whatever you yeah. want to call it, 
we have two canons. We have the show canon, the Game of Thrones canon, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and we have the Song of Ice and Fire canon. Okay. Yeah. And in the in the book canon, um, obviously, I'm still writing The Winds of Winter. I'm sure you all know that. And then there's <laughs> another book beyond yeah. that. And as I write them, and I've said this in a previous blog post, I, I always knew that things were going to be different. But as I'm writing, as the stories are coming alive and the characters are coming alive, it's taking me further and further away from uh, the, the show. So there's going to be some very mm-hmm. considerable differences. And the book canon is going to be quite different from the, the show canon as we get uh, <sighs> deeper into it. I would believe if they cut so many characters, how could it not be different on that yeah. alone? Well, yes. I mean, I'm still writing about Victorian Greyjoy and, and uh, Ariane Martell. Yeah, Martel. that's my love. I love Ariane the best. So I was I was devastated when they cut her. I thought she was perfect for HBO. <laughs> Shocking. Yeah, so I, but yeah, I, like, I was less I like devastated. Ariane too. And uh, <laughs> you know, there are a number of other characters in there, you know, a damp hair. Mm-hmm. And even some of the characters who are in both are very different. I mean, their version of uh, Euron Greyjoy is... <sighs> Day and night from my version of of Joran Greyjoy, and uh, you know similar um, similar changes. Um, so, so there are t- are two different canons now, because most of these shows that we're developing, almost all of them, are prequels. Mm-hmm. I think it's a single canon mm-hmm. um, yeah. because. Both all of these prequels can lead up to mm-hmm. Game of Thrones at, yeah. at the beginning. Yeah, uh, the one that's a little trickier is the Jon Snow show because that's mm-hmm. the only sequel. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, um, it's a little tricky. I mean, it keeps me it keeps me busy, and I don't know what's going to come. But we do have, as I say, a number of different shows in development, and everyone has a different showrunner. Mm-hmm. But everyone also has me, <laughs> and uh, in in uh, some capacity, and uh, you know some other other uh, people that I work with him. One of them, uh, T. McHale. Yes, I um, love T. Yeah. She's she mm-hmm. is. I think T. knows more about Westeros than uh, than I do. Sometimes she I knows uh, her she stuff. has an amazing grasp of it, and she's been. Uh, a consultant on uh, many of these uh, shows in development. Mm-hmm. But what I want to avoid, and I don't know how many shows are going to go, hopefully more than one. Yeah. Um, but as I said, we have the book canon and mm-hmm. we have the show canon. What I don't want to happen is that we have 17 show canons. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Every, every mm-hmm. different showrunner decides to take it in a different direction. And nothing makes any sense because yeah. there's no consistency. You have to have connective tissue. Yeah, absolutely. Lucasfilm yeah. has their story group, as they call it. And it's a, a set group of people who are in charge of managing, keeping things relatively consistent. Who has that? Lucasfilm for Star Wars. It's called the oh. story group. Um, yeah. And I think it's a really... It doesn't seem to have necessarily worked out the best for them. I don't know, but in no, general, they, they they're seem trying to have let some inconsistencies yeah, they, sneak they, in there. They have, they the have. Books so have like, been better than the show. Yeah, they have, they've got some good Star Wars books out but there right. that are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but they're they're trying to have a consistent, cohesive universe, as it were. Yes, um, they're also sure. doing a lot of prequels with that, <laughs> and they abolished the expanded universe. Sort of yeah, they, well, they did it, but only so that they could. Sm- add it back in there's things from the original expanded universe that they're adding back in like they're they added thrawn back in for example so they right. are they kind of just wiped the state slate clean as it, it was were. already it, it, it wasn't was a mess. so it, it yeah. conflicted with itself so right. um, but, <laughs> kind of yeah. needed to be done i suppose uh, so I, I like you to- know the, the the whole question here um about canon What the fans have to keep in mind, <laughs> and I, I hate to say this because I, I don't want to sound like I'm attacking the fans. I love the fans. I'm a fan myself of many of these franchises. Mm-hmm. But um, we're making this shit up. <laughs> <laughs> there is no real, you know. If, if I go back and I read a novel about the uh, World War II or something mm-hmm. like that, I'd be expected to get it right. And mm-hmm. history is what it is. But here, whether it's Harry Potter or Star Wars or Star Trek or Lord of the Rings or my stuff, we're making this stuff up. And uh, then someone comes along and they want to change something <laughs> or make it up differently. And uh, 
Usually, if you're somebody like me, you don't like that. <laughs> you like the way you did it. Yeah, you did it that way for a reason. <laughs> um, yeah. But um, <laughs> it is the way the process works. And uh, especially when you're being adapted or when you're, you know, I think the word canon, and uh, I haven't looked this up. I may be completely wrong. But I think the word canon actually derived out of Sherlock Holmes fandoms, mm. the, the, the Baker Street Irregulars and all that, mm. who, who, because Sherlock Holmes became one of the most popular characters in the world, not only in Britain, but all around the world. He was, he was one of, uh, boy, I remember at, at least back in the sixties and seventies, it's probably different by now, but I, I remember reading an article that said in every country in the world, there are three characters that everybody knows. Tarzan, Sherlock Holmes, and Superman. <laughs> <laughs> now, today, it, it, that might be different. Yeah. Um, but be Sherlock funny. Holmes was huge. And a lot of people started writing, you know, it, later when their own Sherlock mm. Holmes stories and pastiches, uh, you know, when when um, the Holmes stories were still in the copyright and uh, Arthur Conan Doyle was still alive, they had to disguise them you know it, you can yeah. like uh um i think it was august derleth wrote a series of stories about a mm -hmm. consulting detective in england called solar ponds <laughs> and he was sherlock holmes going <laughs> by a, a different name <laughs> you can read the Sh Sol solar pond stories they're still out there mm. um but the point is the the biggest street of regulars which i think was the big group for holmes things said no None of that stuff actually happened to Sherlock. None of these stories by later people. Um, the canon, and that's where I think the, I think mm -hmm. the first ones, is only the stuff written by Arthur Conan Doyle mm -hmm. himself. That is the canon. The is and everything else mm -hmm. is just, uh, you know, Fanon. As other stuff. Fanon. Yeah. Yes. People um, call semi-canon, yeah. Fanon, head canons. There's a lot of variants. I think people get a little hung up on canon. Um, just, have, you know, enjoy the series. They do. And it, it, it's one of these things that, you know, how do you define the word? Define the word, I'll tell you what's canon or not. You know, mm -hmm. you, can, you can't say, yeah. no, uh, Scarlett O'Hara had three children because, um, you know, she... So, I guess if I'm going to re-ask the question, then the question would be, are some of the interpretations in House of the Dragon the true telling, or I'm not some? Would you well, say? I was deliberately playing that in, yeah. in Blood and Fire. Exactly. I, I, was, I was playing with the... the history with actual history and writing this as a fake history book and uh and i had a lot of fun with that and i and i know some readers didn't like it they wanted a traditional novel it. our <laughs> listeners loved it i, I was <laughs> furry i really went out of my way uh, when that book was coming out to say because i didn't want anyone to buy it and be disappointed because mm -hmm. it wasn't like the others i kept thinking this is not a novel this is not a novel I even went on my website when, like, the Yuga nomination was made. Do not nominate this for best. <laughs> you know, if you like it, I wouldn't mind nominated for best related work, mm, uh, yeah. which I thought was a category it fit in. Maybe yeah. it actually didn't fit in that category. I don't know. Yuga rules can be a little obscure, but um, it was not a traditional novel. It was a. I, I called it fake history at first, and then some of my readers said they hated that term, so <laughs> sort of calling it imaginary history. But mm -hmm. it is. It is. It is a pseudo history of sorts, written by an in-world character. I, I, long, long time ago, um, before I even dreamed of Game of Thrones or any of the books, I was writing my uh, what would have been my fifth novel if it had been published, uh, which was a, a set in 1890s New York, hmm. uh, historical horror novel uh, during the era, great era of ye yellow journalism, oh. uh, and I had a you know a killer was on the loose and. I had three reporters from rival newspapers chasing him. Uh, the, the New York Journal, which was published by William Randolph Hearst. Um, the New York Herald, which was published by James Gordon Bennett Jr. Mm -hmm. And uh, the New York World, which was published by Joseph Pulitzer. Um, had a lot of fun with that. I wrote 200 pages of it, but uh, yeah. That's another whole long story. No, it never went anywhere. We never huh? could never could sell it. But oh. um, so as you still have it, just sitting in the archives. Yeah, I actually was published in a the oh, two hundred okay. page fragment was published oh. in a book called Quartet that I oh. did years ago when I guess one of lost them. The point of the story is uh, Pulitzer Pulitzer's uh, newspaper, the New York World, um, was very successful, and he built 
a building for it on Publishers Row in New York City, where a lot of the newspapers were on like the same block. And he built this building, which had a, a golden dome on the top. And at the time it was built, it was the tallest building in the world. <laughs> it was the tallest building in New York City and the tallest building in the world. Mm. Uh, it, it was kind of funny. It was built right next to the, uh, the, the headquarters of the New York Sun, which uh, was a paper edited by a guy named Charles Dana, who was a kind of a curmudgeon mm. and <laughs> uh, didn't like Pulitzer much. And so they had a rivalry. But the world was much bigger than the sun. So it said, well, Pulitzer can spit down on the sun. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, I'm researching researching the book. And this is the tallest building in the world now. It doesn't exist anymore. Many years later, it was knocked down to build an approach for the Brooklyn Bridge. Hmm. And I'm reading, well, how many stories did it have? And I'm reading these the resources. Oh, it had, uh, I don't remember the numbers. It had 15 stories. Now, wait a minute, this other book uh, 14, <laughs> 14, 15. <laughs> and then I encountered one that had 20 stories. <laughs> what? What? It's, it's the most famous building in the world at the time. And I can't even find a reputable source as to how many floors it had <laughs> and this is only like 1880s 1890s 1900 this is not 2000 years ago <laughs> and that really impressed on me hmm. that history is it i love history but it's so unreliable to know what actually happened oh. uh, i mean history it, what i love about history is it's full of stories it's full of great stories and uh, you can take them and change them around and use them. They're all grist for the mill. But there's a lot of doubt about some of the best stories. They may have been invented later by singers or storytellers or some historian who wanted to make a point or, you know, color it one way or the other. And the more you read about history, the more inconsistencies you had. So I thought it would be fun to do that in Fire and Blood. So when I'm I'm relating what happened here, you know, and I'm I'm thinking about what can happen. Well, I, yeah, I, oh, this would be great. This would be really outrageous. It would be, and then eh, it's probably too outrageous. Too outrageous. <laughs> Here's probably what the more realistic version of it. And oh, wait a minute, this this version makes Fred the villain and Bill the hero, and this version makes Bill the villain and Fred the hero. And then at some point it hit me, why don't I give all versions? Because history is uncertain. <laughs> I'll give all versions and. It, it'll be fun for me. I can put in all the really outlandish, scurrilous thing that mm -hmm. the way Mushroom sees it, but I can also put in the things that are probably more. Their sources. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that worked fine yeah. for those who like that thing, although mm -hmm. some don't. Um, but if I was writing it as a novel, if I'd been writing this in a, in the form of a, 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 the books in the small price of fire, mm -hmm. like, Winds of Winter, which I'm writing now. I mean, when I get to a chapter of Winds of Winter um, and I know something's going to happen, well, I, how does it happen? What are, what are the things? I think of the, oh, I could do it this way. I could do it that way. I have to make up my mind. In Fire and Blood, I didn't have to make up my mind. <laughs> but Ryan and Miguel, when they're adapting right. it, uh, they <laughs> largely had to make up their mind. Mm -hmm. We did have some interest way back in the beginning, way, way back in the beginning. Actually, with, there were previous writers on it before Ryan, but there were some interesting discussions about uh, how we could present the material in Fire and Blood. And, you know, you could do it uh, the Rashomon way, mm -hmm. if you know that reference. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and present multiple versions of the same story. We could also have done a frame device where we could have included Archmaster Gildane. And mm -hmm. uh, just like in I, Claudius, one of my favorite TV shows, oh, yeah. every episode is framed by Claudius writing his history. And then you flash back to what he wrote. But we could have had Archmaster Gildane with all of his primary sources doddering around. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd do it and no, oh, no, but there's this <laughs> other version. And and you could have done oh, that. But um, it would have been real fun. It would have been. It would have been fun, but um sadly, uh nobody really wants to do the frames framing kind of <laughs> device anymore with uh Claudius. Um mm -hmm. Yeah, Last Duel did it, I suppose, um, kind of recently, a little bit of that. They did, um, yes. That was a, that was an interesting uh, um, take on that. I like that movie. I'm not mm -hmm. sure the world did, though. It, it didn't do that well. It was uh, yeah, COVID. It was. Yeah, it got a little, you know, but it didn't do super well. Was not ideal. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, 
you talked, we were talking about how, you know, working on fire and blood is history and it's very different to write. One thing that we like to highlight in our show is something called parallel lives, which is the idea that there are parallels in your histories to current characters. Do you, have you found? You sold that from Plutarch, didn't you? Yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. I I read those all when I was a lot younger. I I love to apply it to to a song of ice and fire. (laughs) We've observed it in A Song of Ice and Fire. Have you found that in like writing fire and blood that it allows you to maybe play with plot lines or arcs for the characters in the main series? Do you do that consciously? No, I don't. Don't. I don't do it. It's not consciously. Interesting. I, I mean, certain similarities are inevitable. Yes, but, um, that's for sure. If anything, I try to veer away from that because I don't mm. want to feel like I'm uh, repeating myself. Mm. Right but history um, just naturally repeats itself. It so. yeah, well, <laughs> yes, uh, there, there are certain resonances in history and uh, there are certain um, universals about uh, humanity, you know, that's people true. competing for power, people competing for love, lust. Yeah. Um, all of these, all of these things. Some of these things yeah. Sometimes yeah, people are like, that's a stereotype or that's cliche. I'm like, that's because it's true to the human experience. <laughs> yeah. It's just true. A, a <sighs> person in a, with a lot of power being paranoid. That's yeah. That natural. That happens a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that also applies a lot to, to regular, to real world history, I suppose, or to, to homages. What about when you're writing in an homage? For example, one of my favorites is, You've included in the night fort scene with Bran. Uh, there seems to be a lot of homages to Tolkien and the Minds of Moria in that scene, which I love a lot. Is that also something? Do you aim to do that, or is that also kind of accidental, or, or maybe you have some thoughts on your process there? Well, I, I love Tolkien, and actually, the Minds of Moria is one of my favorite uh, favorite uh, sections of uh, Fellowship of the Ring, that and, and that's mm. that's my favorite of the of the trilogy, Fellowship. Mm. Um, not that I don't love them all, yeah. um, <laughs> but I don't think I was consciously trying to do that. But okay. they, again, you don't know. I mean, you read these things and they lodge, uh, sometimes in the front of your brain, but sometimes in weird corners of your brain where they pop up at, at some point. I did want to, you know, make the night for a sinister pace with its own legends. It was very old. It's a very big castle crumbling. Um, and I wanted to give it that sense that so many things have have gone here mm. um now which are true and which are not true i mean <laughs> I, I always okay. tend to look at not only other fantasy books and history but like uh, the real world here mm-hmm. i mean we we have these um get me in trouble here for what i'm about to say but we, we have these legends that some people believe are literally true in our religion i mean mm-hmm. we you know, we talk about uh, um, the Garden of Eden. Was yeah. there ever actually a Garden of Eden? Mm-hmm. Was there an Adam and Eve or, or the, the flood? Uh, Noah and the flood. That's a good one. I mean, that's mm-hmm. a great story. God was pissed off. He made it rain for 40 days and 40 nights. The entire world was flooded. <laughs> and everybody died except for this guy, Noah, who <laughs> built a big boat and he got two of every animal on <laughs> earth. I don't know how the kangaroos got it down from Australia. <laughs> To the Middle East, but they, but they did. Even the mosquitoes. Uh, <laughs> even the mosquitoes. Yeah, two of everything, and it, it, it's a terrific story. Ricky Gervais has a, a very funny bit where he makes fun of it in one of his things. <laughs> but it's a story. It's a, it's a colorful story. And uh, of course, there have been some archaeologists in recent years who have said, well, it could be that you know, at a certain place in 2000 BC. The Tigris and the Euphrates flooded, mm-hmm. and the land between them was not the entire world, but the Tigris and the Euphrates, and then there was a flood, and maybe the archaeology. So these things sometimes have a source, mm-hmm. but um, that's not the same as 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 the story. The story is mm-hmm. is bigger and more colorful, as stories tend to be. I mean, if I'm picking on something for history to adapt to it, as I, I've often yeah. said in interviews, I turn it up to 11, yeah. or yeah. I turn it up to 111. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, because you don't ever want to make it smaller, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do a story that will be, you know, kind of just like the Crusades, but I'll, I'll make it smaller and duller. No, <laughs> you have to make it bigger and cooler, otherwise just... Mm-hmm. Read the just yeah. read the historical fiction about the actual crusade or the wars <laughs> of the roses 
or the anarchy the or any of the uh, any of these things do you have any authors or sources that you've read that were like nonfiction accounts of those I'm, i think you think you recommended um oh there's a lot of sharon great- k penman many years ago in your blog and i, I read everything she wrote after you yeah and she wrote a, a, a great book about the anarchy so, uh, yeah uh, when uh, christ, when christ and, yep. and his saints slept it's beautiful uh, Stephen and matilda yes a terrific book um uh, another author had a lot of influence was Thomas B. Costain. Mm. Now, uh, he was a very popular author. Did you name Eleanor Costain, House Costain, after him? Is that a reference on purpose? It kind of know. slipped in there? <laughs> Could be. I, Could be. <laughs> at this point, I've lost track. Uh-huh. Um, but he was a very popular historical fiction writer of the, the 50s, maybe even the mm. 40s. Mm. And mostly he wrote novels, um, some of which were made into movies. The uh, I think it was the Silver Chalice was uh, based on one of his books. Interesting. Okay. And um, there were a couple others too. I'm I'm going, but he also wrote uh, a nonfiction history of the Plantagenets mm. and uh, four volumes: history of Plantagenets mm. from where the Plantagenets originated and how they became the kings of England. And and, and it, it it's a generational thing. So it's quite like fire and blood, you know. He's, yeah. There's this, you know, he's he's writing about uh, Henry the Second, and then Henry the Second dies, and you get Richard, and Richard dies, and you get John, and <laughs> you know, generation after generation, all the way to the Wars of the Roses, which was the ultimate end of the Plantagenet dynasty. Uh, mm-hmm. He doesn't go on to the Tudors, and it was really readable. It's full of great stories, um, stories, and how good it is as history. I don't know, probably. Mm-hmm not great history but a great read mm-hmm. and i don't have to worry since i'm not a professional historian and i'm writing fantasy <laughs> about getting the history wrong or uh, something like that and yeah. uh, i i just have to worry about telling a, a great story and history is full of uh, mm-hmm. great stories that That's not to true. say that some of them can't be improved in media <laughs> writer by being turned up to 111 <laughs> yeah <laughs> What about the series The Accursed Kings? That's an influence on Yes, that, right? that definitely. Uh, that was Maurice Duran, a, a, a French writer. I love that series. Um, very, very uh, serious French writer in, in most regards. He was made uh, part of the French Academy, mm-hmm. which, uh, you know, guards the French language against, oh. like, incursions from English and oh. other things. They don't oh. like that. <laughs> um, but the, the Accursed Kings was sort of his his popular uh, series of books, and they're, they're also great too. It's about the uh, curse of the Templars and the, uh, the fall of, uh, of, of Philip the Fair and his three sons and how the, the dynasty, uh, the Capetian dynasty ended and um, the, uh, yeah, the, the Valois came in uh, and the Hundred Years' War. So it's, it's again, great characters, great really story. Good, yeah. Baby swaps, poisonings, all that good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a big hmm. fan. Yes. What do you have next here? Let's see. Let's. Uh, should we ask about radio serials? Oh yeah. yeah we Did were you listen to radio serials when you were younger. Was that a was that a thing for you? You know, I, I I've heard a few of them, but not a lot. No, okay. I, mean, I was a, I was a little too young for that. Radio was largely over. Okay. Yeah. By by the time I was uh, a kid and had a radio, hmm. I did listen to uh, like uh, sometimes late at night. Uh, I would listen to radio talk shows. Mm. There was one guy in in I was in born in New Jersey, Long John Nebel. <laughs> <laughs> he had this uh, show on it. It came on at like midnight or something, so I would listen to it in bed. Mm. And he frequently had science fiction writers on uh, <laughs> Frederick Pohl, Lester Del Rey, they some of the other writers, Theodore Sturgeon, I think, mm-hmm. were guests on his shows, and they discuss outlandish things in the middle of the night. But mm-hmm. I like that show. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, over the years, a few people have made an effort uh, to bring back radio drama. Yeah, but I don't think any of those efforts have ever really succeeded. Mm-hmm. Not um, on radio. I think that that is a- coming back in podcast and form, audio and audio book form, form. there's a lot is... more versions that have sound effects and voice actors and right. that's part of why we asked because we thought that maybe one day that would be something that could be done with the song of ice and fire because it would be yeah. an audio version that's unabridged but it would add some, some battle sounds and well, we acting do have and things audio like that. books yeah right but with unfortunately with roy's their teacher's passing it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a 
complete no. cohesive yeah. thing. But Roy was amazing. He was. Oh, I yeah. worked with him on Beauty and the Beast. And the Super thing about amazing. Roy was he 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 was an actor. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, there there are a lot of audiobooks out there and there are um people who make their entire career as reading audiobooks. Mm-hmm. And some of them are really, really good, but they are readers. Yeah. yeah. They are readers. Roy came into it not reading the book, but acting the book. Mm-hmm. Giving every character his own <laughs> voice. And uh um, you know, it's a little strange at times because of course. I can easily write, uh, so-and-so said this in a Dornish accent. Well, there is no Dornish accent. <laughs> so Roy would have to make it up and say, well, I'll, I'll, I will make that a Spanish accent or yeah. something like that. <laughs> I'll, I'll give, make this guy speak Welsh and all that. And Roy was a master of accents and all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but he was, um, I don't know when he started that, but he was uh, as old as I am now when he uh, started doing that. And uh, so he, he's, he's doing women, he's doing eight-year-old boys. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge, but he yeah. did an amazing job for it. He yeah. really did. I'm, I've listened to those audiobooks. If they were taped, I would have worn them out. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, he is phenomenal. Uh, I've listened to a lot of other audiobooks, and there's just the voice acting is, the acting aspect is, I've never run into anyone who's done it like that. There's him. nobody quite like Roy, but we have some of the good audiobook readers. So Harry Lloyd. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, read yeah. some and Ian Glenn, mm-hmm. uh, you know, some of the Duncan fantastic. Egg stories and then Fire and Blood and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, we've had some good readers. Yes. I would, I would love it if you could get two readers. I just, I really think the series, like, there's so many characters. I think having a woman and a man's voice would do so much for my enjoyment because it's hard to hear a man do a child's voice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, have but, you yeah. listened to the wild cards audiobooks? No. Oh, I haven't. Do, they, do you do that for that? I'll have, maybe I'll have to check well, that we, out. We, we have, yes. Um, well, that makes sense. There, there are, you know, there are many wildcard books, but mm-hmm. uh, I think only eight of them, maybe nine of them exist on audiobooks. Now, oh. the first two, the first two were done uh, for one company, uh, mm-hmm. Brilliance, I think, and they were done with a reader. Mm-hmm. So one mm-hmm. guy reads, but if you, you know the wildcard books, if you yeah. read them, they're mm-hmm. mosaic novels yeah. where there are many different viewpoint characters intercutting, either in separate stories or sometimes fully intercut in the same mm-hmm. narrative. So uh, when we got to the third book, I believe it was, we, uh, uh, for complicated reasons I won't get into, we switched to a different company and we wound up with Random House Audio. Mm-hmm. And I was able to persuade them to have a different reader for each um, story. Very cool. Ooh. Very cool. Now, th- there's still issues there because even though, uh, let us say, um, uh, the story, the protagonist story, maybe Water Lily, um, mm-hmm. say, and so we got um, for Water Lily, uh, we got a, a a woman. We got my friend Lena Esco, who's been in SWAT and mm-hmm. you know some other things, mm-hmm. and she she read Water Lily's story. But in Water Lily's story, there are other characters that appear. So mm-hmm. you, she was still reading, and, she, and there were scenes where you mm-hmm. know. Hiram Worcester appears or, or Yeoman or so many other people. And that's true in everything. But we did have uh, a separate reader for, for each character, mm. I think, from volume three up to like volume eight or so. Mm. And then uh, for, for complex reasons, we stopped. But we're about to resume again, I think. Oh, so, exciting. Uh, we, will, we will have more of those, yeah. Mm. But if you get too many readers, then you get into the issue, well, is this a... You know, there, there's legal issues. I mean, is mm. this a is this an audio book or is this a radio yeah. dramatization? Mm. And I have the right to do an audio book. I don't have the right to do a radio oh, authorization. Yeah, yes. you know that those kind of complex Absolutely. things that, come up here. That makes mm. a lot of sense. I wouldn't have thought about the difference in how it's defined and how that affects right. your rights, but of course it would. And if you start adding sound effects or yeah. things like that, then then you're right over in the edge into radio mm-hmm. and uh, and so then so hbo forth, is like so. hello this is yeah. a little bit too close to game of thrones mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 oh, interesting um it's interesting to i mean i'm just speculating here i don't want to seem like an expert but i know um the rings of power is coming out the yeah. Tolkien thing yeah but there's also something called the ride of the Rohirrim that's coming out yeah, yeah. that is done by entirely different people yeah, they didn't get all the rights. <laughs> and, and it's, yeah. it's a, what is it, animated? It's, it's, uh, it's a little odd. Yeah, I'm not yeah, clear on that I think either. so, yeah. I, think yeah. Is, yeah. I believe so. But yeah, that's a, that's a strange situation, the way those rights got portioned out. It's, hmm. yeah, not typical. But. <laughs> Tolkien 
was probably the greatest fantasist of all time, but he was an innocent uh, babe in the woods at, at uh, dealing with Hollywood and, and uh, mm. these things. I mean, if you look at the original animated things long before Peter Jackson, he sold the first two books to, was it, it was Ralph Bakshi, I think, who did Fellowship of the Ring and the Two Towers. But it was, who was it, Hannah Barbera or somebody like that? Oh. Did, Maybe it was it them that did the third one? The third one, or, or okay. and, and, and they also did <laughs> The Hobbit. Um, so The Hobbit and, and The uh, Return of the King are done by one animated, and the first two are done by a different one. How did he manage to separate those? Yeah. Who the hell was representing him? Yeah, <laughs> yeah right? Wow. Yeah. Uh, so... Of course, it was a different world back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We should maybe ask about games now. Okay. There are a lot of games based on A Song of Ice and Fire. Many, many games. There's both official ones and unofficial ones. And I, I want to know about the unofficial ones. Uh, we were curious <laughs> if you had heard about these unofficial ones or not. And we were curious as well if any of them were particularly interesting for you to see realized. Um, there's, you know, there's the board game, the card game, the tabletop game, the video games. Well, so many of those are official. They're things yes. where I, I those are all rights, uh, you know, dark sword, mm -hmm. uh, which works with uh, CMON. Um, you're doing yeah. the, 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 uh, yeah, the, the miniatures. Of, mm -hmm. I mean, you see, I have some of the miniatures. I used to work for the owner of CMON. <laughs> and uh, they're doing the, the tabletop miniatures game and all mm -hmm. that. But then I had Fantasy Flight was doing a card game and, mm -hmm. and still are. And uh, various people have done the board games. Mm -hmm. That yep. actually became, um, you know, somewhat of an issue way back when. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I mean, the books, the, the first book came out in 1996. And. The second book came out in 1999, and the third book came out in 2000. And, uh, you know, by that time, the books were very popular. Each one was more popular than others. I was hitting the bestseller list. So I had various people approaching me with offers for subsidiary rights, as they were mm -hmm. called. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I like games. I love miniatures. That idea was thrilling. You can see my collection here all around. Yeah, <laughs> we sure can. My, my toy knights and uh, yeah. miniatures. Um, and, you know, my agent got involved and we negotiated deals and we, we signed some of these. Uh, replica swords mm -hmm. with uh, Jalik Incorporated, Valer Valerian Steel, as they call mm -hmm. themselves. Uh, Dark Sword with the, the miniatures. Mm -hmm. um, the coins, which are done by yeah. the Shire love, Post. We Mantis. love this. Um, big I, collection of I made all these these deals and a couple others besides. I won't go into mm -hmm. any of that. Well, you go forward to like uh, now 2007, 2008. Uh, I, I've turned down like half a dozen people who wanted to make movies of these, mm -hmm. right? And David, and, I meet David and Dan on legendary lunch at the Palm yeah. in Los Angeles. <laughs> that turns into dinner because we're talking for hours. And oh. I, I say, okay, uh, we seem good guys to work with here. Go ahead and see if you can sell it to HBO. I was out of TV by then for so long. I mean, I yes, I'd been very active in TV for ten years, roughly up to the mid '90s. But you know. This was like 2007. It was like 12 years I'd been largely out of TV. They weren't going to let me run the show or be the showrunner or even do that. It was like, oh, well, your guy worked in TV back in the Stone Age. But Dave and Dan were hot writers, and they <laughs> and I thought HBO was the place for it. We all agreed on that, yeah. and so they sold it to HBO. But then we started to try to negotiate the deal with HBO. Um, and my agents took charge, you know, money, rights, title, all that stuff. Those negotiations are always fine, and all that went fine. But Suddenly, we hit a bump on the subsidiary rights. Mm. And HBO was saying, well, we get all the subsidiary rights. <laughs> and I said, well, I, I can't give you all the subsidiary rights because I have these, like, eight contracts here. I, this guy has miniature rights, and this guy has replica sword rights, and then mm -hmm. this company has card games. I can't give you those because mm. I've worked. And they, they were actually kind of puzzled by that. Their legal <laughs> department saying, no, wait, 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 you can't. <laughs> We always get all subsidiary. <laughs> we always get all subsidiary. We have all the subsidiary rights to the Sopranos. We have all the subsidiary rights to all of our shows, you know. And I said, I understand that, but I can't give you rights that I no longer own because I've sold it to these other people. 
<laughs> so um, we finally got that through them, and, and we got the uh, deal that cut out those rights. Mm-hmm. Um, although it does have, you know, clauses in that, that only so long as those things are active, Oh. Do they keep the rights? If mm. if Valerian Steel, for example, ever stops making swords after a certain point, those rights go uh. to HBO. They mm. <laughs> and the Valerian Steel guy is actually very very smart because the first thing he did was make a deal with HBO. Uh-huh. That's, why, <laughs> that's why there are two versions, and you can uh-huh. see them around my house. Yes. you know, there's it's canon. You know, there, he makes the show sword mm-hmm. and. The book sword. Oh. I think you're sitting in front of the book version of Needle. Oh, right so there. I am. <laughs> oh, I better watch out. Yeah, no. looks sharp. <laughs> and the show version of Needle is somewhat different. So, let's see. We have some listener submitted questions. We would like to get into some personal questions. I've got a quick one here. Maybe oh. this is this might be very quick. Or yeah, we, want, we, we like quick answers. Um, too. A world building question. Would you say that uh, folks in your world of, of a song of ice and fire do, do individuals have or believe in the soul like the concept of it or is, do you, would you say that it actually exists there or is that too uh too meta well yes <laughs> i i i mean I, I don't think i've ever used that word but no um, you haven't you like shade or ghosts shade or shadows or ghosts, ghosts but, but i i think it depends on what religion you, you uh, follow yeah. Uh, sure, they, yeah. a number of them certainly believe in some sort of afterlife um, you know, the worshipers of the old gods believe that you, you know, your spirit goes into, uh, you know, the, the weirwood trees, or if you're a warg, you get this, the second life where you get to live as a hawk or a wolf or a mm-hmm. bear or something. Um, but eventually, all the souls, if you will, or the spirits go to the same place. Mm-hmm. But the ironborn, you know, will think you're having a big party with the drowned god under the sea, you know, and his sort of wet Valhalla. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the faith of the seven believes in um, seven hells and seven heavens and all of that stuff. So hmm. there is some belief in the, in the hmm. afterlife, yeah. Right. But it, as more and more religions uh, hmm. come into the world, as yeah. I expand it, you'll probably see more and more different so systems. Let's ask about um, a couple questions about Valyrians that I have here. Did Valyrians from non-dragon riding, riding families practice incest as well? And did Valyrians other than Targaryens have dragon dreams? If you can answer either of those. Um, no, I don't think they particularly would. I, I mean, I haven't really thought about okay. that. Okay, uh, fair so enough. I reserve my right to change my mind, but no, I don't think. There was a specific reason for the uh, for the incest, mm-hmm. which was to, uh, you know, I mean, obviously they don't have, these are medieval people and ancient people. They don't know about DNA or right. genes or any of that stuff, but they have some rough concept of it in which they attribute to the, the blood. Mm-hmm. Um, well, this guy has blue eyes and his children have blue eyes, but um if he marries someone with brown eyes, hmm, well, now all the kids have brown eyes. <laughs> Why is that? They have some things. So yeah. We can control dragons. We don't want to lose that ability. Mm-hmm. Not everybody can do that. So we better we better keep it in the in, in the family, so to speak, or at least with the other dragon riding families. Mm-hmm. Now there was, I haven't gone much into it, but there was another very powerful group in Valeria who were not necessarily the dragon riders. Mm. And those were the people who practiced blood magic. Mm. Um, and um, which, you know, there's some overlap in the Venn diagram with the, with the dragon riders, but not necessarily okay. complete overlap. Mm-hmm. And then there were just the regular people. There were a lot of slaves because there was a slave society. There were a lot of poor people. I think of ancient Rome or something like that. Yeah. I, I don't know that they would have any reason to uh, to practice incest. Okay. okay, but you said with the but the the people who work blood magic, they wouldn't necessarily have to. You know, oh, they might they too. If they, it runners. depends on how they okay, uh, define might. their magic. Okay, what about I, the dragon I've always dreams? felt, um, and I know here I'm an outlier because I think most of fantasy writers, contemporary fantasy writers, would, would disagree with me. But um, I I never wanted to devise a magic system mm-hmm. as yeah, it's called. Too. A lot of fantasy writers 
you know, are very proud of their magic systems they divide. And to my mind, magic and sorcery is it, it's not part of the natural world. It's it's supernatural. It's unnatural. It's dangerous. Um, and and if you if you make it so systematic that okay, if you take the the eyes of a newt and the balls of a bat and the blood of a virgin and mix them together, <laughs> you'll you'll get uh, a so, love potion. Just a <laughs> then you've just you've taken the magic out of magic and you've made it science, but you've right. made it fake science. Science mm -hmm. that doesn't really work. <laughs> um, yeah. And I. Not interested in that. I mean, <laughs> I, I think you, you look at the history of uh, magic in the real world. Magic, and for most of human history, people believe that there there was magic, there was sorcery. They believed there were dragons. They believed there were witches. Uh, but did their magic actually work? <laughs> I mean, if the magic actually worked, then they would have ruled the world, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, but, but did, their magic works sometimes. You know, if. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly you got a bad case of boils. You would blame the old woman down the down the road that uh, gave you the boils for you didn't like her. So uh, and and then if you could convince people, they might hang her or set her on fire. Um, but she couldn't give boils to everyone. Or <laughs> she couldn't do that. It was magic was unreliable. It was dangerous, and 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 I think that's also true of dragons and blood mm -hmm. magic and everything uh, kind of magical and sorcery that goes on in my world. It's not. Hmm. It's not easy. You're evoking things that maybe yeah. you shouldn't mess with. <laughs> so there would have so, been lot of some accidents, presumably. And mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. yes, and there have been. <laughs> um, <laughs> for example, um, Doom of Valeria. Yeah, that, was pretty <laughs> pretty <laughs> yeah. that went wrong. You could yeah. say very wrong. <laughs> Something went wrong. Although there yeah, are so. theories about it being mm -hmm. a little less accidental and a little more. Um, deliberate on the faceless men's part but we won't make you say anything on the record but there are <laughs> theories about it not necessarily you know uh, there are theories about everything you've written theories that's upon true. theories um, that's yeah, good theories. i like people arguing about it and having theories about it yeah it is and all of that stuff yes yeah. yeah we wanted to tell you some of the like fandom adjacent terms like we uh, you know, you've dubbed some of them in world. Like, for example, you created the Red Wedding and called it such in the, in right. the world. But then fans came up with the term the Purple Wedding for Joffrey's wedding, or the Pink Letter for the Pink Letter, which you probably know what we're referring to. Yes, uh, I do. Although so, I, those terms do not appear in the book. That's yeah, they don't. Yeah. Um, so I, would, I have think the Golden Wedding. That, yeah, uh, yeah. Wedding, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. There yeah. and then there's uh, some other fun ones like, like you... people. I hate when people use the term Fagon because it's very spoilery and not necessarily accurate. I just call them Young Griff, <laughs> but that is a term that people use. Yeah, short uh, version of Fagon. Had you heard that term before? Fagon? Yes, I have. Yeah, I was like, okay. yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it That's does indicate one. that they have already made their they've made their mind their decision. Yeah, about they've, yeah. Taken yeah. they've taken Tyrion's hint. So I don't know about but, this. <laughs> more, yeah, I'm like, I'll just call them Young Griff because lots of people have not gotten to that point in the series yet. Yes. So let's uh, yeah. let them. Uh, yeah, our, our and that's a huge, uh, you know, mm -hmm. getting back to your question, canon. That's a huge canon difference because he, mm -hmm. yeah. he does not exist in in the uh, in the books, not. butterfly effect, or in the TV show. He exists yeah. in a big way in the books, but not yeah. in the TV show. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk about a couple of personal things as well. Um, you have told us in the past, and we were it was very random. We were at a lunch with you, and you mentioned a cat that you had named Asha, and how she was a killer. And I've just been dying to know ever since. What are the other names of your pets? I know it's a silly question, but I, I would like to know. Everyone would like well, to know. Well, sadly, Asha is gone. Oh, um, but uh, she she was a great cat. Um, but um. Yeah, I don't, we don't have many cats named from uh, my books. Uh, we've Just had names, a few period. I'd over like the to years, know we, all of we them. had at a, at a certain period, uh, my wife Paris and I. Paris is uh, of uh, Irish descent, among mm -hmm. other things, and she likes Irish history or not. And and uh, I'm also partly Irish, but mm -hmm. uh, not uh, not quite as much as she was. But at at a, at a certain point, you know, I, I mentioned I Claudius that I yeah. I loved. Um, so we had. We had a cat named Augustus, oh. and we had a cat named Caligula, uh, which, of course, is Roman for little boots. Paris, oh. uh, Paris was not a big fan of Roman sire and refused to call him Caligula. She would have called him boots. Oh. Um, but Augustus and Caligula, sadly, are, are both gone. Oh. Um, although Sid, uh -huh. my assistant, who's been coming and going, yeah. com 
without any inspiration from me, completely independently, she has a cat named Caligula oh. and a cat named Claudius. Uh. Uh, and that was where I was going. I wanted to name our next cat Claudius. I wanted to name a cat uh, Messalina oh. for his wife. But Paris, uh, you know, threw down the gauntlet and said, no, no. You've had your Romans. Now it's my turn to name the cats. So uh, <laughs> we, we had some uh, Irish cats there, and oh. we still have one, Grania, oh. uh, named after the famous oh, female pirate of the Irish Sea. Cool. And uh, we had a couple Irish named cats, too. Very That's cool. Neat. I've got a question about Paris. Um, specifically, at a convention years ago, you told a story about your first real meeting with Paris in the sauna. Yes, um, I did. At the 1975 Kubicon. And the thing that got me is that she, Paris had a very funny quip that I have not been able to remember. I have not been able to find online. What, what did Paris say when she saw you in that women's sauna? Do you remember? I, I, I do. She, she did. A, I, I'm not sure you're, you were young creatures, but do you know who W.C. Fields is? The famous, and he had a, uh -huh. a particular way of speaking. Mm. <laughs> she came in and she did a W.C. Fields voice where she said, you know, that prose in science fiction fandom prose is the name for professional writers. Mm -hmm. right. Go to conventions, there are fans and prose. And there were not just me in that sauna, but there were a number of other people, including uh, Joe Holderman, I think, and uh, a few others. And uh, she came in and saw us and she said, ah, uh, naked prose <laughs> in her best uh, W.C. Fields voice. Thank you. Brilliant. It's been driving me crazy for years. I've been like, Paris had this really clever thing she said, and I couldn't remember. <laughs> Thank you. I, could, I found the story, but not that. Um, I don't know. Now, this was 1975, mm -hmm. and I've, Paris and I have told that story we heard many, it many times over yeah. the years, but I'm getting, you know, I mean, science fiction fandom is changing, and it's mm -hmm. all this you know, I, I think if that happened today, we would uh, they would call the police. We'd <laughs> we tell you, we banned from conventions, and we just got to go to canceled. small conventions. But in those yeah. days, there were there were a lot of people fooling around at conventions. There were half of the conventions I went to, the fans would go skinny dipping in the hotel <laughs> pool. And uh, yeah, I'm, uh, Sid wants to go back to those oh. days, right? We're, <laughs> we're happy to tell you that there's definitely still wild convention times. We go to some small conventions that are like 300 people where that is alive and well. We go to one called Ice and Fire Con that is dedicated to your series. It's only 300 people. And there's been a lot of love matches there. There's like a few marriages that have been made there, a few hookups. But uh, yeah, it just lives this, on. Just this last year, they but did probably a no skinny demand in the hotel pool. Oh, I won't say that on the record. Yeah, <laughs> there is a hotel pool, but you know, what happens at it? You know, that, stays, that stays at Ice and Fire. Park. Yeah, what happens but, at Ice and Fire on stays. But I will, Ice Fire. quick anecdote about something that happened there last year. There was they host a tournament and a melee every year where people use foam noodles uh -huh. to fight with yeah. and to uh -huh. joust with, and the swords are plastic. It's it's highly entertaining. But at the end of it, a a, a, a fan dueled another fan like a quick. Um, like a melee duel, a melee called duel. him out. When he, when he won, he declared he was naming a queen of love and beauty and proceeded to propose to this woman. And her parents were hiding behind and she and they all appeared and it was a really wonderful moment. Oh. <laughs> she, of course, she said yes. And <laughs> it was great. Oh. And that's, uh, she's an artist that's, uh, that's has gone fully professional, mostly just creating art in your world. So it's oh. a really I, great I, story. I, I, I have to tell a story there too. Oh. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I hope these people aren't still in the, in the fandom. I don't mean to hurt anyone's feelings, but in the early days, it was probably like 2002, 2003. It was 2001, I think, the Brotherhood Without Banners yeah. first started having parties. 2001. This is a couple of years later, but still early in the history. And uh, one of the fans uh, came up with me with a, a copy of the latest book and said he wanted to proposed to this uh, girl in, in in the group. So he wanted me to write in a book instead of just, you know, best wishes or keep your sword oh. short or something. He wanted to write, um, you know, I don't remember what her name was. Uh, you know, Dear Nymeria, yeah. uh, will you marry Aegon? I'm yeah. using names, but it wasn't that. It was <laughs> yeah, real names. It was Susie and Fred or something. Yeah. It, but he wanted me to write Will you marry me? And I said, I can't write. Will you marry me and give her a book? Yeah. Just think that I'm proposing to her. <laughs> I'm not proposing to her. <laughs> I, but if you want, I will write. Uh, you know, dear Nymeria, will you marry Aegon or something like that? Say, oh, okay, yeah. So I wrote that in the book, and then there's a big party. There's, uh, you know, we're crowded in the home suite, and and he he gave her the book, and she opened it, and sad to say. 
he did not get the response he wanted. Oh, she oh no. at her, she said, Are you out of your fucking mind? <laughs> That's oh, hilarious, though. Oh, I'm going to have to ask around in the VWB and ask to find out who that was. When I, when I, like a, watching a football game and somebody <laughs> proposes in front of 70,000 fans, were you married, Joe? You know, uh, <laughs> what happens when she says no? It would be so traumatic. I, I don't know if that guy ever went out again, but uh, yeah, or what her. happened to that particular <laughs> book? Is it still sitting on her shelf? <laughs> Well, that was a book back then. Yeah. <laughs> that was a hardcover. <laughs> Sid is looking at us sternly. I think we have to end, yeah. end this. Yeah, end it. I want to say one more thing before we... Before one, I want to say thank you. Yeah, Two, thank you. I promised some other friends that I would mention that also at Ice and Fire Con, they've done two musicals based on your series. One, Westeros, an American musical, which is based on Hamilton. And one is called Queen's which is based on, I don't know if you've heard of Six, the musical. It's about the six wives of Henry VIII. Oh. And so it, you would enjoy that musical for one. Um, but I just wanted to mention that you have inspired people to song. <laughs> a whole, <laughs> whole musical. Full musical. A full, full musical. musical. A full musical. Full dancing, musical. Dance. Like, it's on you. They're on YouTube as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a full, and it's, they're adapting a song of ice and fire, not Game of Thrones, very d deliberately. Um, and so yeah, that exists. Um, as a loving tribute to your works. And thank you so much no, for... Fine. I, I didn't know about this convention. Uh, oh. HBO is going to do an official yes. convention. Yeah, they are doing really one in off. December. We're probably going to be going. Um, but yeah, there are all, there's two fan conventions um, based on your works. There's Ice and Fire Con, which is a small 300 and person. Titan Con and right. Titan Con. Um, and I guess there's three because there's also Con of Thrones, which is obviously dedicated to HBO's Game of Thrones, um, more specifically. So yeah, you've... Uh, You've birthed a lot of There's stuff, a, a lot of a whole fandom. Yeah. Around your yeah. Works. <laughs> but, uh, and, you. and a you know, full size industry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Sid. Sid. Well, <laughs> well this was fun. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, really. 